the test turned out to be flawed. Uh, testing kits that were sent out into the field returned uh, false results. The test had to be withdrawn and restarted. And only a month and a half into this whole process did the CDC consider letting private labs, university hospitals, university labs develop their own tests. Indeed, universities that were developing tests in parallel were not allowed to deploy those tests by a bureaucracy at the FDA. They, they had not, they, you know, they did not get the appropriate authorization to get these tests out into the field. So testing in the United States was delayed by a month and a half. And then when it was done, it was again slow. Uh, it, there was much more than, than, the, uh, than the 45 days uh, in terms of the impact of the delays on the actual virus. One could argue that at least in places like New York, by the time the testing was deployed, the idea of testing, tracing, isolating was impossible because the system was overloaded by positive cases. The earlier you catch a pandemic, the sooner you deal with it, the sooner you test, trace, isolate, the sooner it is all over. The United States and the Western world generally completely screwed this up. Uh, South Korea, on the other hand, early uh, in, Jan in mid January, as soon as they, uh, COVID was recognized as uh, a, a viral problem, uh, they invited private companies, private labs, university labs, uh, to submit their own tests. They rolled out testing quickly, they deployed it quickly, and they got the virus under control very, very quickly in a highly densely populated area like South Korea. So when government deployed private sector as they did in, um, in South Korea, in Taiwan, virus was held back, testing was efficient, con uh, the virus was con uh, contained, and uh, the number of deaths, the number of uh, victims of COVID was significantly reduced. When government decided to go on their own, as they did in the US and to some extent in Europe, it turned out to be a testing disaster. And you see that across the entire uh, Western world. And many, many tens of thousands of deaths are, should be attributed uh, to this failure, not just of the CDC to develop a test, it's not clear why they should have developed a test to begin with, but the CDC's and the FDA's uh, bureaucracy that prohibited uh, private enterprise from deploying tests uh, and, uh, and, and getting this under control. Even today, when uh, we already have, uh, you know, according to government numbers, over 400,000 people who have died as a result of COVID, even today, there is still no cheap, quick, home test that I can put in my home, test every time before I go out to find out if I'm contagious or not, which is what a, a quick antigen test would do. Uh, thus, if, I'm, if I test positive, I stay home. If I test negative, I go out. There's still no quick home test available, not because the science is not there. Indeed, the science was there months and months and months ago, as early as May and June. There were companies that, were, that had developed such tests uh, saliva test, you could just take home, swipe on the saliva, and uh, know whether you are contagious or not. The FDA refuses, continues to refuse to approve these tests for, for use. Uh, in one case, they approved one test that cost $5. It's a kit that costs $5 that you can take home and test. They place so many requirements on the sale of this kit including that it has a sophisticated app and the communication set up and all of this, that the kit ultimately costs $50 instead of five, thus reducing its use, reducing the number of people who want it, reducing the number of pharmacies that are selling it and making it useless. Again, the free market developed quick, cheap, easy home tests. The FDA prevented us from using them for a bunch of bureaucratic reasons. Among them, you know, things like accuracy. Remember, 400,000 people have died already. Imagine if these tests were only 50% accurate. Well, half the time that people would go out and infect other people, yes, half of that would have still continued, but half would not. Half people would have stayed home. You would have reduced the infection rate. You would have reduced the, you would have lowered the curve, right, by 50%. But it doesn't matter. Nobody cares because we are so much in this mindset that it is the regulatory state, it is the rules, it is the bureaucracy 
that protects us from those evil corporations, those evil markets uh, that, that would function in a free market. If the FDA focused only, only, if the regulatory state focused only not on regulation, but on actually just stopping fraud, on the purpose, in my view, of law, which is to protect our rights, to protect our individual rights, rights as conceived by John Locke, not as they have uh, morphed into in, in modern times. But if the, if, the, if the agencies like the FDA just were there to prevent fraud, to prevent people from selling us tests that didn't work at all, I think you know hundreds of thousands of people would be alive today that are dead because the market would have provided us with tools to deal with identifying those who have, um, who have the disease and therefore would have reduced transmission dramatically. Now that's just testing. Let's move on now quickly to the issue of vaccines. I mean, one of the great amazing stories of the vaccine development done privately, by the way, by Moderna and by a small uh, biotech startup in, uh, in Germany uh, that Pfizer teamed up with, is the fact that the vaccine was developed over a weekend. In January, when a Chinese, when a Chinese researcher, without the knowledge of his government, luckily for all of us, without the knowledge of his government, put up on a shared website the genome of the COVID, of COVID, Moderna, over the following weekend, uh, already developed a vaccine that would address the COVID, um, the COVID uh, virus. They then uh, took that to, uh, you know, to the development center, to, to factories to produce it. Within a month, they actually had a vaccine at hand. They then did phase one test to make sure that the vaccine was not harmful, do no harm, by Late April, early May, there was a vaccine that was deemed safe and ready to launch. Now, in my view, in a free market, at that point, you would take that vaccine and you would offer it to people on a voluntary basis, providing the information that tells them that, yes, there's a risk involved here. It hasn't been fully tested. It has its efficaciousness, whether it actually prevents a vaccine, we don't know. But imagine volunteers signing up slowly in May, in June, maybe by the summer as the vaccine is proving to be safe because people are not falling dead and actually efficacious, which it turned out to be much later on, maybe millions of people start taking the vaccine in the summer. And again, maybe instead of 400,000 dead, we only have 100,000 dead. But that is not allowed. We don't allow, the regulatory state does not allow me the right to negotiate with a biotech company about taking a vaccine that the bureaucrats have decided is inappropriate for me to take. You need double blind studies, you need the whole rigmarole. Now, true, uh, during this crisis, the government has been very good to speed up the process. So instead of taking years to go through uh, FDA approval, it took only months valuable months, months in which many of our grandparents and many people with pre-existing conditions died because the regulators had to check boxes and they had to go through the studies like they've always gone through studies rather be open to alternative solutions. They denied us the choice. They denied us the option of taking the risk of taking the vaccine. Now, I've talked about the cost in lives, but think about the economy. Think about the fact that millions of people are unemployed today. Think about all the restaurants and businesses that have been destroyed because we did not deploy testing on time, because we did not have a vaccine out in the summer. Think about the economic cost, the cost in life that the regulatory state has cost us by slowing down and by making ineffectual a response to the virus. I'll even add that in spite of the speed at which the vaccine supposedly is now being released, and, and we'll talk about distribution in a minute, one of the things that we're fighting is evolution. Because 
the longer we wait, the, the greater the chances that the vaccine evolves. We're already seeing uh, variants of the, uh, sorry, not the vaccine, the, the virus evolves. We're already seeing, uh, you know, uh, mutations of the virus that we don't know the South African mutation might be resistant to a vaccine. So speed is essential. And instead of giving us the option as individuals to engage with the vaccine, the regulatory state says, no, that is impossible. You have to have FDA approval. Now, I won't get into all the other ways in which the FDA, in a sense, kills us by not approving drugs, by taking very long to approve drugs, by not approving drugs for all kinds of uh, marginal reasons, again, denying us choice, denying us the ability to choose whether to take on risk or not. They decide what's risky, what's not risky, what's good for you, what's not good for you. Look at the vaccine distribution now. I mean, this is, it would be funny if it wasn't so tragic. The government is taking on responsibility as a central planner, as, a, as again, a regulatory, re regulatory agency to distribute vaccines. They've set up ethical rules in terms of who can and who cannot have vaccines. In New York, they're literally trashing vaccines because the penalties for giving a vaccine to somebody out of line, right? Not in the order dictated by the regulators is so high, it's cheaper just to throw the vaccine out. So instead of rolling out the vaccines as quickly and as effectively as possible as the free market would do, We've got a bureaucratic, paper-filling, box-checking bureaucracy that is being created for the distribution, and the distribution is going unbelievably slow. I mean, Joe Biden just promised 100 million vaccines in 100 days. Do the math. That's a, a million vaccines a day. That's a million shots a day, right? That means you would, it would take a year to get everybody one shot but we need two shots. That means the United States gets vaccinated in two years. That is this 100-day plan. That is pathetic. So think about how a free market would distribute this. Think about if you gave the responsibility, as private companies would, to distribute this not to governors and state institutions, but if you gave the responsibility for distributing the vaccine to CVS, Walmart, FedEx, and UPS. Does anybody have a doubt that we would have plenty of vaccines It would be quick and it would be efficient and effective and everybody, all of us could get vaccines when we wanted? But think also about how they've structured who gets a vaccine first. I mean, yes, we can all agree. And I think under free market, free market system, health workers would get the vaccine first. Hospitals would be massively incentivized to pay a premium to get the vaccines to vaccinate their workers. But think about the fact that in the UK, the first person to get a vaccine was a 91-year-old old lady. Why? It makes zero sense from an epide epidemiology or from a common sense perspective to vaccinate very, very old people who don't have a lot of social interactions. If you want to stop the spread of a virus, the people who should be vaccinated first are the people who interact with other people the most. People who need to go and work. If companies were buying the vaccine and distributing them, they would be distributing them to the most valuable workers, the people who have to show up at work. Therefore, you would cut the spread of the, vi of the virus instead of these bizarre you know, codes uh, there, there's somewhere there's this stat about how long it takes to vaccinate one person to give an injection to one person in New York. Because of the amount, number of forms one has to fill in, it's between 20 minutes and an hour. Now, now imagine you have to vaccinate millions of people and it takes you 20 minutes to an hour to give them an injection. Indeed, in the modern day that we live in today, why can't we self-inject, given that there are, there are these, uh, uh, you know, syringes that, that can make it easy for people to inject themselves. But no, you have to have certification and you have to fill in the forms. And anyway, just the bureaucratic state, which is the regulatory state, is again, making it impossible for us to get vaccinated, is slowing down the process, and thus, again, killing people and destroying the economy. 
all at the same time. Now, this is not surprising. If you had asked me what would happen if we had a pandemic and the government was responsible for every aspect of the response to it, it would have been easy to predict that the disaster of 2020 and as we roll into 2021 continues would have happened. What is necessary for innovation and success in order to, uh, in order to achieve, to get products to market and to get valuable products? And a vaccine, after all, is a product. A test is a product. Well, first you need innovators. You need innovators to come up with great ideas and to figure out new ways of doing things. What does innovation require? What does production require? Well, what production and innovation require is the ability to think, to think freely, to think out of the box, to imagine solutions that maybe didn't exist before. What does that kind of thinking require? What kind of environment and atmosphere does that kind of thinking require? What well, requires freedom? It requires the lack of authority. It requires innovators, entrepreneurs, scientists be left alone to produce, to create, to think, to experiment, to fail. Indeed, the most innovative places in the world are by no accident the freest places in the world. The most innovative periods in human history are no accident the freest periods in human history. And the most innovative industries today in America, let's say, are no accident the freest industries. Do you know that airplanes today actually, every generation of Boeing plane is actually a little slower than the previous one. We have not had an innovation in flight since the Concorde was grounded because it's such a heavily regulated industry. We have almost had almost no innovation in automobile engines up until Tesla. And Tesla evolved outside of the standard auto companies because it could escape the controls, the regulations that are imposed on the auto industry and have been imposed on the auto industry for so long. Of course, it also got government subsidies, but that's a whole other story. Innovation requires thinkers to be able to think outside the box, which is exactly what regulation and bureaucracy cannot allow them to do. Authority, authority that believes that they have the truth and know exactly how things should be done does not permit innovation, progress, and growth. And that's why our economies only started growing substantially. We only saw real innovation and progress post-enlightenment when the human mind was freed Freed both of superstition, but also freed of a rule of a king, a rule of, a, of an authority of the church that dictated what was permissible and what was not permissible. And we have slowed in the rate of innovation, progress, and growth in the 21st century because the regulatory state has expanded its realm and encroached in more and more and more industries and places. Regulation and government generally represents the opposite of what freedom, of, of what, sorry, not freedom, of what innovation requires. At least government the way we see it today. Government that protects individual rights is a government that does what? It is a government that protects us from force. It is a government that protects us from the imposition of somebody's will on us. And that's it, a proper government, a government limited to the rule of law where the law is focused on protecting our rights and otherwise leaves us free. Does not tell us what drugs we can and cannot use, what tests are good or no good. It catches the crooks, the fraudsters, the bad guys and leaves us to use our own judgment in deciding what to use and what not to use, and how to live and how not to live. When government imposes regulations, 
most of them preemptively in advance under the assumption of harm, it destroys. And what it mostly destroys is, if you will, the unknown, the things that were not developed, the solutions that were not tried, the innovators and the entrepreneurs that did not start a business, create a new company, create a new product. So we don't see their costs. Unfortunately, in 2020, we saw the cost. And the cost has been horrific. The cost has been devastating. Now take that and expand it on every single realm in which the regulators in every single industry touch. Because I think that is the damage that is being done every day by the preemptive law, by the uh, oppressive law, by the bureaucracy that is created by all these alphabet agencies that have been created over the last, what, 75, 80 years to regulate our behavior, to regulate business, to regulate and control markets. The consequences are unknown because we don't, we don't have a parallel universe where this isn't there, but the consequences are dire. And I think you can extrapolate from what happened last year to see that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nielsen. Um, All right, can you hear me? All right. So I got to say up front, I love the Federalist Society. Uh, and one reason I love the Federalist Society is almost always uh, I am the person who is the most free market person on the in the conversation. Um, and today I am the moderate. Um, so, so there we go. This is, this is nice. Uh, as you know, I study administrative law and I share a lot of the concerns about, you know, agency myopia, uh, agencies that are, the idea that they are, you know, super scientific and they're always doing exactly what the science says just is not empirically true. Um, you know, that said, it's not, it's not, it's not all altogether false either. Um, there are really smart people who are working really hard things and doing their best. Um, but you can look at the history of regulation and there's all sorts of overreactions to things and things of that sort. So I'm sympathetic to a lot of what was said. Uh, I'm gonna push back, however, on a few points. Um, that is my job as respondent today um, is before we get to COVID in particular, just some general thoughts about theories of why regulation uh, is okay and when it might be okay. Uh, and one of the main theories of why we need regulation um, is externalities. And a lot of the things that we're hearing about uh, where innovation is stifled and all of that is no doubt true, um, but the pushback that you will hear is, but wait a minute, some of these things you're talking about, it's not just you who is affected. Um, what you're doing is going to impose, possibly impose harm on others. Uh, so for instance, we heard about planes, that we haven't had any real um, progress in planes. Now, put aside people who, who voluntarily choose to fly on a, a potentially dangerous aircraft. Um, that's, we can have a question about paternalism and all of that sort of thing, whatever. Um, dangerous planes are not just dangerous to the people on them. Um, dangerous planes are dangerous to other people as well. Um, and, you know, I, I pulled up on Wikipedia here, list of um, aircraft accidents that have harmed people on the ground. Um, and there's lots of them. Um, so maybe we should be a little bit concerned about somebody who says, you know what, I just want to start flying my own plane. I've come up with this new model. I want to get out there and do it. Um, because that might very actually harm, harm other people who are just living their lives quietly and suddenly a plane comes from the sky um, and does massive damage to their property or even to their lives. Um, you know, a lot of regulation that we see um, is thought of in terms of externalities. Uh, I do a lot of environmental law, and that's one of the things that they'll say. They'll say, wait a minute, why are we regulating clean air? Because you don't have a right to make my asthma worse. I'm sure that you have, um, you know, a good idea, and it maybe it makes society great, but the benefits to society are dispersed, and the harm to me is concentrated. Uh, and now I am suffering a lot. So you can make, you know, you can buy a Maserati um, and that doesn't seem right. 
Um, so that is one of the theories that you're going to see. And it's actually kind of hard to solve the externality problem uh, because we disagree about what's an externality and what's fair play. Um, and, that's a, and that's a problem. Another area where, you know, traditionally, um, even the common law recognized um, regulation um, is for natural monopolies or common carriers. Um, and I saw that just, a, I think earlier this week, or if not last week, uh, Richard Epstein, um, who is a very smart, prominent um, libertarian and expert on the common law, says, uh, you know, about the, you know, Twitter and Facebook and some of the social media companies, well, wait a minute, they're essentially act akin to a common carrier-like status. Um, and thus, there's grounds for regulating. They, they can't pick and choose who can use the services. Um, and, you know, we can disagree about that and we can fight about whether, um, you know, imposing common carrier obligations on natural monopolies helps or hurts or, uh, you know, maybe it discourages innovation. So it, it's not really a natural monopoly at all and so on. Um, but historically, that was one of the arguments. Uh, if you want to have an inn and you are the only inn in the town um, and travelers want to go on the, on the road, you got to let them in um, and you can't diverge. And if you have a mechanism like that, then you need to have somebody to enforce it and you start to get a little bit of an apparatus and, and so on. Um, now this is gonna get a little bit more controversial, but whatever. Um, another theory of this is um, in fact, um, regulation serves as almost a vouching mechanism. So it enables people to travel. So, you know, you're driving with your family and you're hungry and um, you, you go to McDonald's because it's not great food, but you know what you're going to get. It's there's consistency. That's a private form of a vouching system. That's why we have franchises. Is you can at least trust the franchise. Um, but sometimes you're driving and you're in a small town and there's no such franchise there, um, and you're hungry, and you say, "Well, you know what? I live in the United States, and there's a pretty good chance that this restaurant that I'm showing into uh, has a health inspector." Um, and I'm not going to get sick. Um, and there it goes. So now I feel a little bit more comfortable eating. You could, in theory, have a franchise network for everything. Um, so anytime you go to some new place or do new product, there's somebody who vouches for it. Um, but that doesn't always work very well, um, at least historically. And we like the idea of having, you know, food inspectors. You and we even said like pure fraud um, prohibitors. Um, we agree with that, that, wait a minute, we can't just have some huckster who sells things um, because you have some confidence when you go to the market that somebody has checked. And the tort system in theory could do that. But the problem is there are folks that are judgment proof and you don't make big decisions about you know, purchasing something that affects your whole life. Um, and it turns out that the person that is essentially judgment proof so if you didn't have some sort of backstop, the theory goes, you're going to be really nervous about engaging in commerce with people you don't know. Um, and the government um, can be a, a pretty good backstop um, to ensure things aren't fraudulent and things aren't going to make you get salmonella and so on. Um, and you could have the private market do it, but, the, but you're going to have some inefficiencies there. There's going to be gaps. Um, Every time you purchase something, you shouldn't have to see the other person's um, net worth decide whether they're judgment proof. Um, and this is essential way to, to grease economic transactions to allow more, more trade. Um, and then the last one, I'm sure that we're gonna have a disagreement here um, and that is democratic preferences. Um, and sometimes, you know, people like certain things that are not um, free markets. Um, you know, the example that I have, so I grew up in Washington state and my grandparents lived in Idaho. So every summer we would drive from Washington to Idaho and you can't go there unless you cross through Oregon. And Oregon has this very peculiar rule that you can't pump your own gas. If you want gas in Oregon, um, there's somebody who comes out and puts the gas in your car. And even as a six-year-old, I'm like, this is the biggest waste. Um, because I've spent my whole life in Washington and I watch people put gas in all the time and there's not the, some marked difference between the people of Washington and the people of Oregon and their com cognitive ability to use this complicated, no, it's anybody could do it. 
but here's the thing. Um, Oregon has decided for whatever reason um, that they like that. Um, maybe it's aesthetics. Uh, maybe it is, um, a, you know, a, a social safety net. They want to help people have jobs, whatever. I'm not sure what it is, but it's not because they're ignorant. Um, because the people in Oregon also go to Washington. They see how it works. And nonetheless, they've, they've kept it. Now, there's theories about government failure. Um, maybe there's special interest groups that can organize better and keep the people from voting, or maybe. But it's a really long time, and it's a pretty easy thing. And most of the West Coast states have a lot of um, referenda. Um, and nonetheless, they've decided to keep it. Um, other examples would be um, almost all places have bans on selling organs. Um, you can imagine a world of a, a very efficient world uh, where you know you don't need um, two kidneys. Um, you can function perfectly well. Um, there, are, there are poor people. There are rich people who really need a kidney. So how about we have the poor person sell the kidney to the rich person? The poor person is better off uh, because now they have more money and they're still healthy. And the rich person doesn't have to go through you know dialysis and all of this. Um, and why not? That's a great world. And you know, when I was in FedSoc as a student, I saw presentations about that where people would come in and say, actually, this is killing lots and lots of people, not allowing, not allowing us to happen. Um, and you know, I could be persuaded by that, but there's a kind of a funny thing, which is most of the time, if you present that to voters, um, voters are not necessarily going to sign up for that. Um, and you know, so when I hear regulatory state as an admin law person, I usually worry about democracy deficit where people are doing stuff without the, without the, you know, the imprimatur of the people. But some of these things, in fact, do have the imprimatur of the people. They vote for them. They want these things. And the idea that we are going to, to change it um, runs into real democratic problems. Um, to go to a little bit of what we're talking about with COVID, um, you know, people constantly vote against price gouging. Um, there's laws where they say no price gouging. Um, as a matter of democratic legitimacy, these are very strong. People vote for them. They're crazy, or at least often are very crazy, um, because if you have a hurricane coming, boy, you want to get as much product into the market as you can, as quick as you can. And by artificially inflating that, you can just do Econ 101. You see the problems that creates. But nonetheless, people vote that way. And it's hard for us to say, well, you know, so long as we are committed to democracy is another element of, of freedom. Um, that that's not okay. Now we can persuade each other and we can talk about that as a process point, but at the end of the day, sometimes they're just gonna vote for these things. Um, and you say, well, how does that all of that fit in? Uh, so finally, I wanna talk a little bit about COVID in particular. I confess, I don't know anything about this other than what I've experienced as a human being for the last year. Uh, I'm sympathetic to some of the, what has been said. It sure seems like there's a lot of uh, you know, inefficiencies in how we've set things up. Um, and not a lot of logic and a lot of decision making. But I could throw out some ideas that might explain some of these things. Um, so one of the ideas that we heard is we should just have vaccines. The private companies made them early. People should opt in. If they want a vaccine, get a vaccine. If you don't want a vaccine, don't get a vaccine. You, you're informed of the risk, make the choice. And I think that somebody might very well say, but you're running into the externality problem. Um, People buy one of these things from some huckster. Uh, they don't get it from Moderna or somebody. They get it from some, some other folk. They're not super smart about how this stuff works. They buy it. Now they think that they are safe. Um, and then they go everywhere um, and spread the disease. So you need some sort of mechanism to prevent that. Um, and it's, it's fraudulent. So maybe we have FDA go after the, those folks. Um, but there's problems sometimes at the margins when we know who's the huckster and who's not. And what if they say, but my vaccine works, um, you know, 70% of the time. Um, and you say, well, is that good enough? Is that fraud? Is it not fraud? Um, you have people who buy it and then they go up and now they start, you know, spreading disease. Um, maybe we want to have, um, because of human fallibility, maybe we need to have something higher um, because otherwise you're going to have people who are spreading disease. Um, in good faith, they think they're doing right, um, but they're just not. Um, we also, you know, again, this is, I'm not sure specific to COVID, not my field, but there was a case um, 15 years ago in the DC circuit um, called Abigail Alliance. Um, and Abigail Alliance was you had folks that were um, 
terminally ill. Um, and they said, well, for me, I should be able to take anything I want essentially because I'm going to die. And if there's someone who sells a product that maybe will help me, I should be able to do that. Um, you know, and the argument was I have a substantive due process right to do this. Um, and FDA said, no, 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 you can't, certainly can't do that. Because if you do that, you're going to destroy our ability to have test groups. Um, you know, we need to be able to know if it works or if it doesn't work. And we understand this means that some folks that are, you know, are terminal, they're going to die. But even so, if we don't do that, the theory goes, there's gonna be more people die. Um, and people fight about that back and forth. Is that right or is it wrong? That's an empirical question. I don't know the answer to that empirical question. I do know that it seems really harsh to the individual, but if in fact it is true that that harshness will then you know, preserve a whole bunch of other people's lives, maybe that's something we leave for the democratic process. Um, it's really hard for humans to assess certain types of risk. Um, what do you do if they say, I have a vaccine, it's not as good as the Moderna vaccine, um, but it works um, you know, 95% of the time and it's got a one out of a thousand risk of death or something. Um, I, I don't know if such a thing exists. Humans are horrible at that type of math. Um, and we can come up with intermediaries that are actually quite good at math that can kind of tell you what's what. Um, but there's some concern, especially in a pandemic, um, that people are not thinking altogether rationally. Um, and there's a worry that maybe we need to have, especially because we live in a world where everything else is regulated. Um, so if suddenly we deregulate part of it, uh, you don't quite yet know what to trust anymore. You no longer have your proxies. Um, so that's part of the concern. And the last one I wanted to throw out there um, is I'm not sure what your view is on patents. Um, patents are, I think, part of what you think these innovators need. Um, you can't have a patent scheme without some sort of bureaucracy um, or, or courts or, or something, but courts only work if you have, the, at the end of the day, the police to enforce the judgments. Um, so even then, I don't think it's a pure free market system in your world where, where we are making some sort of calculations about how many years the vaccine, the patent should be, um, for this type of thing, not that type of thing. So I, I don't know if there's, your world is less bureaucracy but I don't think you can say there's no bureaucracy. There's still going to be bureaucracy unless you just want to throw out patents too. Um, and if so, then we have other sorts of problems. So anyway, those are my reactions. I think that a lot of your points are really strong. Uh, I might be overclaiming on some of my pushback because I want to make sure that we have both sides of the argument. Um, and again, I wish I was a better at COVID. So anyway, that, that's what I got. Thank you. Thanks. That that That's really... All good points. Uh, James, how do you want to proceed? I mean, is, do you want to take questions? you want me to respond? We do have one question waiting in the chat. And I'll just go ahead and um, let him ask it. Sure. Um, I apologize. I am not as good at Zoom as a year of doing school through Zoom would suggest. Christopher, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yes, thank you. Um, Chairman Brooke, I I just wanted to, uh, well, thank you. Um, I'm just, I was distracted a little bit by the paintings behind you. I, I imagine it's John Galt and uh, Howard Rourke. Um, no, no, that's 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 Vermeer, uh, Vermeer's geographer and that's that's a contemporary painting, but no. Okay. No Howard Rourke and John Galt in my walls. Okay, um, anyway. Uh, I was just, uh, I was reviewing a, a book I had on the shelf for a while, and it was, it was about objectivism and the chapter on government. And it talked about um, consent of the governed is a source of the government's power, but it doesn't mean the citizens can delegate powers they do not possess. Uh, the source of the government's power is rational consent based on an objective principle. And so kind of building off uh, Professor Nielsen, the question is, well, if, if Americans, if people consent to this heavy regulatory state, is it kind of, you know, that's, that's it, you know, that's, that's the system we live in. And then that if the people choose this heavily regulatory state, that's the government we, we get. How would you, um, do you have any kind of thoughts on that? So, so I think I think it was Franklin who said something like when he was asked what did they do in the Constitutional Convention, he said a republic if you can keep it. 
and and yeah, I, I mean, freedom if you can keep it. That is the fact is that if most people want to turn away from freedom, then we will turn away from freedom. You can't write a constitution or a legal system that prevents an overwhelming majority of people from getting at the end of the day what they want, which is uh, and and still preserve uh, you know any kind of um, voting mechanism. Now, granted that, given that, I, you know, I want to push back. And, and I agree completely with Dr. Nielsen that we live in a democracy and these are democratic preferences. Absolutely, they are. I reject that that's freedom. I think that that's oppression. I don't, I don't think democracy of that kind is oppression. And it's interesting that we're willing to tolerate a democracy when it limits our economic freedoms. It, it, we're not willing to tolerate democracy when it limits our speech, for example. Uh, I mean, right now, it would be interesting if we voted on, uh, on, uh, on hate speech, uh, we would probably, uh, we'd probably get a majority of Americans saying it should be banned. Luckily, we have a First Amendment that is still respected by the courts, and therefore, we don't have hate speech laws in America. But economic freedom a long time ago, in a sense, it was granted to, 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 demo to democracy to decide. So I, I don't like democracy I, in this sense. I'm all for voting. I think voting is important, but I think what the founders tried to do and didn't do it robustly enough, I wish they would have done more of it, is limit the scope of what we can vote on. I would have liked the provision in the constitution that separated economics from government. That is, I would like to have, uh, just like we separate or tried to separate church from state, I'd like to separate economy from state so that the government cannot, uh, so we can't vote. To, to, to increase taxes, we can't vote to uh, regulate this and not to regulate that, to provide jobs there and not to provide jobs there, to kind of redistribute wealth, to redistribute privileges, to redistribute all, all these things. I, I think democracies fail. I think that the founders understood that democracy in the sense of majority rule, not in the sense of voting. And the founders understood that, tried to protect us from it, but didn't didn't do a good enough job because obviously what we have today we have we dev, we are constantly devolving into more and more and more democratic processes where the majority gets to impose its will through pressure groups and lobbying and, and cronyism and all these other mechanisms uh, you know gets to impose its views on us and where the idea of protecting the individual and protecting individual rights which I think is the philosophical foundation for the declaration of the constitution, that idea is gone. It, it's gone from conservatism, it's gone from liberals, it's gone in the Supreme Court. The, the idea of the individual having rights that are inalienable, that no majority can violate, you know, is gone as soon as I cannot get a vaccine if I want one. And yes, I understand the utilitarian arguments that maybe I'll still be infected and we can't really trust you, so we, somebody, through the democratic process ultimately decides, no, we get to decide when you can take the vaccine and when you can't. We have the ultimate formula of when we balance all these interests just right. To, and, and of course we know uh, through public choice theory and other forms that you know, how they make these decisions are, there are lots of different ways, things that they're weighing in that that, 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 that affect when you can take the vaccine and when you can't, not just science. Science is just one factor. but. So yes, I'm, I'm opposed to democratic preferences. I don't think they should exist. I, the only thing I think should exist is individual preferences. And then democracy should apply to who is executing on the constitution that we have. But the constitution allows government to do very few things, uh, basically to protect us, to protect our rights, not to protect us, to protect our rights. And which means catch the frauds. They say yes, to the extent that we need a bureaucracy. You know, if the SEC, all it did was try to catch Bernie Madoff, which they couldn't, and they didn't, right? They, they, they had to have the Sun Informer. If that's all they did, then that would be fine. But they're so busy reading my 13 Ds and 13 Gs and the million other forms I as an investor have to file with them and monitoring everything that we do and so on that they don't have time to catch people who commit fraud, even when somebody lets, you know, even when the fraud is well known in the marketplace. So, uh, you know, if, if, if all we had were agencies that protected us from fraud, we would have a very different politics and a very different kind of in, 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 in government structure. 
I, I'm not opposed to patents, uh, just, to, just to clarify a few things. I, I'm pro-patents, and to the extent that patents need mechanisms to enforce them, uh, I, I, they certainly need those mechanisms. I believe in, in a strong police, and a strong military, and a strong patent office, and a strong fraud detection, whatever, a unit of the FBI, whatever, whatever's needed there, or, or if you want to turn the SEC into a fraud detection in financial markets. Um, and, and make those as strong as they need to be to prevent fraud, because fraud is a violation of my rights. Patents of property, just like we have a, um, God, well, well, the name is just slipped. Just so we have a place where we register land and, and there's in a sense of bureaucracy to make sure that our land rights are not infringed upon. I think there's an agency that where we register intellectual property and, and it's responsible for not allowing violations of intellectual property. But that still limits government to that one responsibility, which is the protection of, of, of the right to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, if we don't have any questions, I, I'm happy to run down externalities, natural monopolies, and vouching, which I think is, is a great way to frame, uh, to frame this. But I'm happy to answer questions too. Professor Nielsen, did you have something you wanted to say in response to this question? Okay. Yeah. Dr. Clifford, you have time, we'd love to hear that. Yeah, so, so there's no question. I mean, those are the arguments made for regulation and for government intervention more broadly in the economy. You know, externalities, of course, we only focus on the negative externalities. The, the dominant externalities in our culture are positive. The dominant externalities of business are positive. And there's very little weighting of the positive externalities that we lose by protecting ourselves from the negative externalities. So. Uh, the positive externality of, of, yes, taking some risk with some airplanes that might crash and kill some people versus the positive externalities of developing transportation that would be far faster and far more efficient. That's, nobody is weighing that. I, 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 can't, I have find it hard to believe that that is really a concern at these regulatory agencies. The, the whole motivation and whole incentive structure is to prevent the negative. Um, indeed, the Wright brothers, I mean, there was a lot of, a lot of people crashed, a lot of people died, a lot of people crashed into other people's homes when airplanes were first developed. And it, there were some negative externalities as a consequence, but we developed air flight. And I think overall, we would say humanity is better off. And we didn't limit the freedom. We lived in a society that was willing to take certain risks. We, I think we lived in a better society in that sense, other things worse, but in that sense, the willingness to take risk, the understanding that progress required risk, I think was all a positive, but I also think that if you really think about how markets work, right? Take airlines, who has a strong incentive to quote regulate in the private sector airlines so that they're safe? Well, certainly passengers want them to be safe and, and maybe passengers would be, you know, particularly really frequent flyers like myself in the old days before COVID who you know, flew hundreds of thousands of miles a year would wanna know that their planes are get on a safe. Maybe I'd be willing to pay for a service that actually um, you know, went in and, 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 uh, and rated the airlines on safety and actually did the kind of work that we hope the FAA actually does. Uh, what about insurance companies? I mean, certainly insurance companies don't wanna to have to pay out not only for the, for the people on the plane that might crash, but also for the people on the ground that you might crash into. Wouldn't insurance companies develop the capabilities of, uh, of, of figuring out the riskiness of various airlines? Wouldn't there be a penalty in their insurance policy built in for more risky behavior versus less risky behavior? If you're trying out a new airplane and you're flying, uh, you know, maybe the airport where you take off would require you to have insurance on the plane and wouldn't, again, the insurance company demand some evidence that the plane was, was flight worthy. So I find that in almost all cases of these negative externalities, markets are far better, far more efficient, uh, far more open to experimentation, uh, but also uh, um, the costs are borne directly much more so by the people who benefit from being protected from the, external, from the externality. So the whole point of, of, of externalities is in a free market, many of those externalities are internalized. Once they're discovered, right? We don't know that airplanes can cash and kill people until maybe it happens. But at some point we figure it out and we build the marketplace. There's a profit motive incentive to create mechanisms that eliminate those externalities and somebody pays for it. Usually the people who pay for it are the people who 
benefit insurance companies, for example. I think insurance generally is underrated in and, and it's so heavily regulated, so it's a problem today, but it's underrated in terms of a mechanism to reduce so-called externalities to create. And, and by the way, for vouching to some extent as well. Um, so I, I'm not convinced by externalities argument. I, I think again, uh, I think it's, it's, it's also one of those arguments that are very slippery slopes. The government seems to, you know, find more and more and more externalities to regulate more and more and more things. Um, marketplaces are very, very good at these kind of things. Uh, and I think it, it's related to vouching too, because one, if, one of the amazing things about, about Uber and Lyft is that there's no vouching going on. In a sense, there's no external vouching. That is, there's no government authority that says that Uber, particularly in the early days when it started, that Uber is safe and okay. Basically, the safety and the, the, the reputation of Uber driver is the rating they get. That is, customers are rating them as they use them. So when I order an Uber driver, and if the Uber driver's rating is under four, I would cancel the trip <laughs> instantaneously because something is fishy. And indeed, Uber would fire that driver and never use them. So, and, and the same with, uh, with restaurants, with Yelp, and, and you could imagine Yelp developing a, um, a, 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 uh, a whole group of people that goes into restaurants and does what food inspectors do, because that would help him uh, increase their market share, because uh, now they cannot just tell you what other people rated the restaurant, but also what their inspectors rated. So again, for vouching, again, there are so many effective and efficient market solutions, particularly, maybe this is a good argument 30, 40 years ago, but today with technology, there's so much of this vouching that we can do through apps instantaneously and through using kind of the crowd, if you will, to, uh, to secure these things that I just, again, the, 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 the government is, because it is a, it is a um, organization that uses force it uses blunt force, it is inefficient, ineffective, and often <coughs> commits uh, you know, awful outcomes. Um, finally, natural monopolies. I mean, it really, I mean, this is a tougher one, but I, I have to admit that I'm skeptical of the existence of natural monopolies. I, I think that when we walk into an industry and define it as a natural monopoly, we reduce and stop innovation. And, and, uh, and yes, they might be a, a very messy period in which, uh, in which the market discovers whether it's a monopoly or not and whether competition could arise or not and the competition might be messy and so on. But again, I, I, I do not want government involved. I think it, it, it does much more harm, in a sense, creates many more ex negative externalities um, when government intervenes. And, and I think this idea of defining Twitter and Facebook as natural monopolies I mean, it, it just, it, I mean, horrifies me and, and, and scares me about what, it, what next and, and what else does, uh, does the bureaucracy, and with all due respect to Richard Epstein, um, shame on him for suggesting it because I think it's very, very, very dangerous where we go if we start uh, expanding the scope of what we define. These are platforms that were developed by individuals. These are platforms, yes, that, that allow for common carriage, but uh, even common carriage, but it, it's, you know, it's not, there, there are multiple competitors to Twitter, including the telephone, by the way, which is really a competitor to Twitter, uh, messaging, messaging apps, uh, Facebook, uh, the idea that Twitter, Facebook have some kind of monopoly, there's competition constantly arising. Just 10 years ago, these entities didn't even exist. There's no reason to believe that they will exist 10 years from now. Uh, competition might drive them out of the business completely. Twitter base barely makes any money. That's unusual for, for a monopoly not to make any money. One of the characteristics of a monopoly is that they make massive profit margins. Twitter has barely makes anything. Uh, if not for Donald Trump, I, I doubt Twitter would have survived the last four years because it was, it was literally on the verge of not being able to raise capital before Trump became the, you know, the Twitter celebrity that became and drove so much traffic to Twitter. I mean, it's just, it's just this, it's so full of, you know, who knows what we would have today if we had not defined electric utilities as, as public, uh, as, as natural monopolies or, 
or any of this, or the water system, or the water under the ground, if we treated it as a, a natural resource to be exploited and to be on the profit motive, who knows what alternatives the market would have created to all of those things. What we do know is where the market engages with any one of these products, we get better quality, lower prices, and, and, and a whole variety of options. And where the state intervenes, we get you know, high prices, low quality, and very few options. And I, so I think, again, that the history of the 20th century should be quite clear on where one would fall in terms of the regulatory state. Thank you very much. Uh, we don't want to take up all of your time at one o'clock. We really appreciate both of you coming and um, we'd love to have you in a non-COVID world. We'd love to have you actually on campus. And well, you have a beautiful campus. I've, been, I've, I've spoken at BYU and it's a, it's a great place. So uh, happy, to, happy to come join you in person one day when the authorities allow it. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much.